His professional career is focused on exploring the far reaches of human consciousness, things such as to in intuition, gut feelings, and other PSI phenomena using experimental design. Dr. Radden has also held appointments at Princeton University, University of Edinburgh, University of Nevada, as well as private and governmental think tanks such as Interval Research Corporation and Stanford Research International. So before we get started, I'd just like to say a few words about my fellow interviewers, Ollie Boone and Richard Benjumea. Ollie is a fascinating fellow who serendipitously entered my life and shared much information with me, a lot of which I've shared with you listeners on this show. There are certain researchers who are uncovering missing links in our knowledge of who we are and where we came from. And Ollie downloaded so many documentaries about all of this that it used up the hard drive on my computer. <laughs> and I had to buy a, a new one. It was getting old. I still haven't watched them all. Thank you, Ollie. You're most welcome, bud. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Now, Richard is a world traveler like Ollie, and both of these young gentlemen are completely open to new information and trying to find truths to live by. And so welcome to the show, Ollie and Richard. Thank you very much. And Thank Ollie, it, do you have uh, Dr. Radden on, uh, on the Skype? Hello, Dean. Are you coming through there? Yep, I can see you. There oh, is. excellent. Cool. That's like, can have and, clear. and also, we'll be taking calls, but please hold off until about 2.20 or so. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Radden. Hello. Thanks for that introduction. And by the way, my name is pronounced Radden. 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 Okay, good. We got that out of the way. <laughs> um, yeah, so go ahead, Ollie. You, you've got some questions for Yeah, well, I Dr. guess it, just, to, just to extend on the introduction there, um, Dr. Dean Radin, PhD, um, is a author and co-author of over 200 scientific and popular articles and three popular books, including the best-selling Conscious Universe, um, Entangled Minds, and his new book, which we're going to be discussing later, um, Supernormal. His scientific articles have been published in journals ranging from Foundation of Physics and, and Physics Essays to Psychological Bulletin and Journal of Consciousness Studies. He was profiled in New York Times Magazine. Um, he's also appeared on dozens of documentaries and television shows, including the BBC's Horizon, PBS's Closer to the Truth, and Science Channel's Through the Wormhole with uh, Morgan Freeman. Um, he's been pushing the boundaries of science through investigation where the place of the place where mind and matter meet, where the subjective meets the objective. Um, and now we welcome Dean to Kmud. Welcome, Dean. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so you're the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Um, could you please explain what the term noetic means and what kind of research takes place at your institute? Noetic comes from the Greek root word nous. N-O-U-S, and the closest uh, description that we have of that in English is intuition, a form of knowing where you don't know how you know. And it's distinct from things like rational knowing or memory because uh, it, it is a form of knowing, but it's in the West we generally think of things that you figure out or things that you're told as ways of knowing, but of course there are many other ways. So we study the other ways of knowing. Hmm. The intuition-based uh, kind of gnosis, I guess, would, would, would almost be entailed there. It would be involved right. there, I guess. It's a sense of knowing something without knowing how you know, and in addition, knowing with a sense of certainty that what you know is correct, and oftentimes it is. Okay, excellent. And could you tell us briefly about your scientific background and what areas of research you've been conducting over the past two decades? Well, I've been looking pretty much at the, the whole range of psychic phenomena. Uh, th th it includes several classes of effects that people re commonly report, including telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, mind over matter effects. Uh, the ways that the experiences can manifest are, are very, very broad, but those are classes, or those are names basically that we give for the various kinds of, of abilities. So in today's world, uh, sometimes remote viewing is known better than clairvoyance, but they're exactly the same thing. Precognition is a form of clairvoyance because clairvoyance means that there is a way to perceive that transcends the usual boundaries of space and time. Mm -hmm. So that all of the phenomena basically 
fall into two basic categories, either perception of things distant or hidden, or the apparent action of mind, usually meaning intention, on the world at large. So one is like psychic perception, the other is psychic action. Okay, and maybe you could talk us through a couple of examples of some of the most convincing experiments uh, that you've conducted, showing the evidence that the psi phenomena is, is real and genuine, some of the ones that might be more well-known, perhaps. Well, one, I, I tend not to focus on individual experiments because you're never quite sure in a given experiment whether it was done correctly and whether it's repeatable and all that stuff. So in science, something becomes credible and you gain confidence when not only you can get a good result, but it is repeatable by independent colleagues. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that, that I tend to pay attention to. What I've done in, then in, in that realm is uh, I've looked at a, uh, a form of psychic ability, which is actually an unconscious ability that I call presentiment. And this is uh, when... You don't consciously know that something's about to occur, but you unconsciously feel it. And you might sense it sometimes as a visceral sense. So as an example, when I uh, talk to audiences, even very skeptical scientific audiences, I'll ask uh, how many of you have ever had a gut feeling about something that later turned out to be true and where you couldn't infer what the result was going to be. And roughly 75% of the audience will say yes. And I'll say, well, did you know that there's actually evidence that this is a psychic ability? And then people will put their hands down. <laughs> it, the idea of the experiment was based on a, a, an experience told to me by a, by a friend who's a hunter. And he was preparing for a, a hunting uh, outing in, in two weeks. Uh, he had some rifles and pistols, and he was cleaning it all. And in particular, he took apart uh, his six-shot double-action revolver, mm -hmm. which he normally would keep four bullets in. He would keep – oh, sorry, five. It was a six-shot revolver, and he kept five bullets in with the hammer over the empty chamber so it wouldn't accidentally get hit. So he's cleaning it, takes all the bullets out, puts the bullets back in one at a time. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. We have a dog friend that has joined us. <laughs> yeah. This is Clarence. Hi, Clarence. I may have to go put him in the truck. I understand. Uh, I actually took my dog out just before I uh, started the interview for that very same reason. <laughs> he, has, so, he has the ability of, pre uh, uh -huh. to, to predict when I'm going to be leaving the house yes. somehow. Dogs are good at that. So I'll, I'll finish my story. So my friend is, is putting the bullets back in, in the gun. He has five bullets to put back in. One, two, three, four. He has poised to put the fifth bullet back in the gun, mm -hmm. and he has a bad feeling. And he decides as a result of the bad feeling, which it doesn't make any sense at all, he just leaves it aside. Mm -hmm. So now you have the hammer over the fifth chamber, which is empty, and the next chamber is also empty. And then there are four additional bullets. Two weeks go by. They go out hunting. They come back. Uh, they start drinking, which is not a good idea to do if there's a bunch of guns around. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a fight breaks out, and someone grabs his gun, which had not been used yet, uh, and points it point blank in the face of another person. Well, my friend tries to intervene, but he's too late. The, the, the hammer is, is there, the trigger is being pulled, the hammer goes back, the cylinder rotates, and the hammer goes click. Now, what happened, of course, is that it went click into the very chamber which had the bullet that he took out. Oh. And if he had not taken out that, that bullet, he would have been shot right in the face. Wow. <laughs> so at the time, this is a very dramatic experience, and he figured later that maybe he had something like a premonition when he was cleaning the gun, that there was something really bad about that bullet that he needed to take out. So as a joke, he says that uh, everyone has a bullet with their name on it, and he knows where his bullet is. Wow. <laughs> he put it in his safety deposit box. Uh, yeah. So when he told me the story, it made me think that maybe we could take that kind of experience and bring it into the laboratory. Or, of course, you can't put people under real risk in the lab, but what you can do is modulate emotion. Mm -hmm. And there are standard methods of doing this, and typically involves showing very calm pictures followed by very emotional pictures and a random sequence. And so what I was interested in is, does the body 
which is reflecting of the unconscious, is does the body actually know? Do you know at a deep level things that are about to, to come around that, that are emotional? Mm-hmm. So the experiment is very simple. You put somebody down in, in front of a computer monitor, you monitor aspects of their physiology, which could be heart rate, skin conductance, brain waves, pupil dilation, all kinds of things. And then you show a sequence, a random sequence of pictures, some of which are very calm and some of which are very emotional. Mm -hmm. And you see whether the body responds appropriately before the upcoming image without any way of knowing what the image is, including the experimenters don't know. Mm -hmm. So, So you do this experiment, I tried it, and it worked amazingly well that there was clearly a physiological reaction before the image came up appropriately for calm versus emotional. Now, would that be before the computer, that, that actually would have reacted accordingly before the computer had actually, actually randomly generated the image? Or was that predetermined yes. before? Actually, no, no. before the computer would... It's a wow. true random number generator was used to select the picture immediately before it was shown. Mm-hmm. So the person's response, which is generally between three and nine seconds before the picture, is being made when the future has not been determined yet. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows. So it's a true precognition test. And, and it was mimicking the kinds of stories that my friend and many other people have spoken about where there's some in visceral sense that something is about to unfold, which usually is bad. Mm-hmm. So I published this study, and my colleagues said, that's ridiculous, it's way too easy. Uh, and fortunately, one of my colleagues immediately tried to replicate it and was successful. Mm-hmm. So this was almost 20 years ago. So now uh, a, a meta-analysis has been published of... Uh, something like two dozen studies, similar ideas published in other labs around the world, and it's very clear that we're looking at a real effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's that's an, an example of an experiment that I did, which I now have high confidence in because I know that other people can get the same result. Excellent. I, I can kind of relate to that myself. There was a when I was in Peru uh, last year on New Year's Day, I, I woke up in the morning and had a dream, and I told my girlfriend Steph about it. I just had this dream that my laptop had bullet holes in it, and I woke up with the feeling of my laptop being lost. And it's not like a, a random, you know, I, I, I regularly dream about my laptop. And, and that night, um, my laptop got stolen, and I had, the, I had this, I was, you know, kind of the same kind of feeling of loss afterwards. It was. I think I think a lot of people do kind of experience um, this precognition kind of, and they, a lot of people kind of, kind of just dismiss it. But it's when there's certain moments in our life where you really can't ignore it, and it kind of stares stares you in the face. Right. Um, so just moving on, uh, moving on now to, um, a little bit about your book. Um, could you um, talk us? Could you um, speak speak a little about a little bit about your new book, Supernormal? Seems to be a lot of excitement in the public about it. Everyone seems to be seems to be talking about it. Could you give us like a little brief overview of, of what it involves, what it entails? Well, I've written two other books about uh, science and psychic phenomena and how we look at these things. And I didn't want to write another book that that was on the same idea, but along the same lines, because that's after all what I specialize in. And we're always told write what you know about. So I. I had the opportunity to uh, give a series of lectures over a course of a month in India a couple of years ago uh, as part of a program sponsored by the Indian government. So I went to a number of conventional universities and also yoga universities. Uh, In India, a yoga university uh, is sanctioned by the government in the same way that a regular university is. The main difference is that it, it typically take place at an ashram. Uh, Sometimes they have hospitals associated with them, and the curriculum is a combination of ordinary scholarship and science plus yoga. So it's Ayurvedic theory, it's Ayurvedic practice, it's yoga practice and all that. So somebody can come up uh, through there and end up with a PhD in some aspect of yoga, which is interesting. So I went there because uh, as a a specialist in studying psychic phenomena from a science perspective, I was was in essence studying an aspect of yogic lore, uh, which is called the Siddhis, which is S-I-D-D-H-I. It's it's a Sanskrit term which roughly means attainment or perfection, and it's talking about the special abilities that arise as the result of yoga practice. In the West, we call them psychic ability. So I was going to India to tell them about scientific tests of the cities. 
Of course, in India, it's a very different culture than in the West, and, and everyone accepts that the cities are true. Like There's no question that psychic phenomena are true, and surprisingly, there's hardly anybody, really, almost no one is actually studying the cities. Mm. Whereas in the West, there's lots of skepticism about these phenomena, but there's many more people who are studying it. So th this is not too surprising when you think about it, that you have a culture which completely accepts something. From their point of view, they'd say, well, why even bother to study it? Why study something that's obvious? Whereas in the West, we say, no, that's nonsense. We, we must study it because it, it can't possibly be so. So as a result of, of my, my visit there, I got more interested in what does yoga actually – what is it really, since it's being practiced all over the place – and what does it actually say about the development of what we would call psychic ability? And that, that was the origin and of, of why I wrote this book, which is really about the yogic lore and what we know about that lore that is probably correct. Excellent. And it seems that you've been putting together some of these, the, the yogic, um, the laws, and actually recreating some of what they're saying in the laboratory to, to under experiments, experiments, which I guess we'll, right. get, we'll get onto later. But first of all, could you speak about some of the superpowers mentioned in the book? The book's called Supernormal. Um, now, now, what, what are some of the, the, the superpowers, the supernatural, what some people might call it, but maybe it's a misrepresentation, um, that's described but that some of these cities have? Well, first of all, I make a distinction between supernormal and supernatural. Supernatural, as, as used in English, generally means a divine gift, something from the divine. Supernormal, I, I use as simply a way of saying it's, it's normal, it's completely normal, but it's better than normal. So what an Olympic athlete does is supernormal. And I, I make this distinction because in yoga, the abilities that arise as a result of practice are considered to be inherent and normal, so that anybody could develop those abilities. And you don't need to have a special special grace or dispensation given to you as a gift, you develop it. So what's developed? Well, at the elementary level, the very first city or, or yogic power that's mentioned is essentially precognition. It's the idea that you can gain uh, perception of the past, present, and future all at the same time. So we'd call that, I mean, perception of the past we call memory, perception of the future we call precognition. So that's the first one. That's like the most elementary thing. And in fact, if you talk to people who, who have begun meditation seriously, uh, one of the things that they often say is that they're starting to have more synchronicities in their life. Well, a synchronicity is a kind of a precognition. It's a sense that things are coming together in some strange, meaningful way for the person, sometimes led by a dream or by something else, like the example that you gave. So precognition, then you have a whole range of uh, things that we would call clairvoyance, uh, telepathy, some minor effects of mind-body interaction. And at the far end, at the very advanced end, then you start ending up with superhero type abilities, which include uh, levitation, initially meaning hovering, and then later meaning flying. Uh, the opposite of levitation, which is gravitation, which is becoming so heavy that you can't be moved. Uh, there's inedia, which is the ability to live without eating food, um, invisibility, and, and a number of things like that, elongation of the body, bilocation. There's, there's a wide, wide range. Within the Yoga Sutras, which is the classic book of yoga, there are about 25 of these that are listed. Uh, within other domains, like in Catholicism and Judaism and Islam, you get hundreds of descriptions of these kinds of abilities. Okay, great. And just in case anyone's just joined us, uh, you're listening to KMUD. Um, this is Bud Rogers' show. Uh, we're, uh, me and myself and Richard are um, guest hosting on the Edge of the Herd. And we're interviewing uh, Dr. Dean Radin from the Institute of Noetic Sciences on his new book, Supernormal. Um, now, um, so Dean, with some of the experiments, what kind of, um, that you've been conducting in the laboratory, um, investigating some of this psi phenomenon, um, what do you, what are the kind of demographic of people that you'd be using for the experiments? Would they just be random everyday people of the street or would they be people who have been practiced, pra practice yoga and meditation for years? And what kind of results have you been getting with those, with those people? 
Well, let me just say that in general, most of the experiments in this realm are like most experiments in psychology in which they're college sophomores and they're not selected for any special ability or interest even. And the, the type of work that I do over the years, I've, I've begun to focus on meditators. And it's not always people who have a meditative practice. It might be somebody who does something which requires focused awareness. Uh, that could be something like a computer programmer or even somebody who plays a lot of video games. Because what we look for is people who are comfortable doing high concentration for a long period of time, given that that's the nature of the tasks that we do. So mm-hmm. whether we're doing telepathy or clairvoyance or whatever it happens to be, we want somebody who can pay attention. So somebody with attention deficit disorder is not going to be a good subject in our experiment. And just as a general rule, uh, selecting meditators, which is all about attention training, they tend to do better. So those are the, the kinds of people that we select. And I tend not to select people who claim that they have strong psychic ability. Yeah. And the reason I do that is because the likelihood is that um, maybe their ability is real, maybe it isn't, but the experiments that we do are not designed to test individual skills. They're essentially an artificial task that squashes the, the ability that somebody may have into a way that can be studied mm-hmm. in the lab. And so sometimes somebody with an incredibly good psychic ability, according to their, ex- their experience, can't do anything in the laboratory. So I don't want them to go away disappointed, and nor do I want them to then go away saying, I've been tested in the laboratory, and here's my stamp of approval. So it's much easier to just select people who don't have any particular claims. Okay, cool. Um, let me think. Okay, so uh, what are your personal experiences with meditation and yoga? Uh, and what have you noticed some of the benefits to be? Have you, uh, do, you practice, do you practice yoga meditation yourself? Have you, have you noticed any kind of increase, uh, increase in, in awareness and, and uh, synchronicities yourself? Or, uh, um, yeah, we're just in, in, curious about that, some of the research in the book. The- I have done yoga in various forms over the years. Now, I have not doing it at present. Uh, and also meditation. Yeah. I, I learned meditation first about 40 years ago. Uh, practiced on and off, uh, but for the last about two and a half years, have, have been uh, maintaining a strict practice. So I do it every day, and that's m- not has nothing to do actually with the cities. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm I, I imagine I have about the same average number of psychic of, uh, psychic experiences as most people. Nothing spectacular. I do it primarily because of the physical and mental health benefits. And this is one of the things that I talk about in the book as well, that one reason that yoga and meditation have really caught on is because research in the t- last 10 years have showed that for most physical problems and some mental problems that people have are related to stress. And one of the best ways of treating stress are yoga and meditation. And so that's why it's now being covered by medical insurance and being used in the U.S. Army. And it's used in many places now because it is effective, costs almost nothing, and it works. Mm. So that's, that's primarily the, the reason that I, I, I practice meditation now. Yeah, now, uh, Dr. Raiden, we're going to uh, turn this over to uh, Larry, our engineer, for... For a minute, he's going to do some business at the top of the hour, and we'll, we'll be right back. This is Bud Rogers, Edge of the Herd. We're interviewing Dr. Dean Radin uh, about uh, uh, ESP and other uh, psychic phenomena. Yeah. Dr. Radin, do you think because of our uh, kind of inurement in the Western uh, scientific worldview that this has kept a lot of people from having psychic experiences or Actually, do they no. or do they come uh, or do the psychic experiences come anyway and this that people may not recognize them psychic experiences occur to about 60% of the population according to surveys uh, including about 60% of scientists mm. so it has nothing to do with what are what amounts to an ideological assumptions it's simply a human experience that happens yeah. In, in, any, in any given case, you don't know if it's psychic or not. It might be a coincidence, but we know that it, it, in principle it could happen, and it probably happens to the majority of the population. 
Is there, uh, uh, have you um, studied uh, anything ar uh, around the pituitary gland? I mean the pineal gland. Uh, and, uh, you know, the pineal gland shaped like a pine cone, the center of our brain. And I understand that it has uh, rods and cones on the inside of it on the in, inner layer, and, uh, er, and floating in the liquid are crystals, silicon crystals. Do you, have you studied that, or is there any relationship between, like, out-of-the-body experiences and the pineal gland? There are some who believe that the pineal gland is associated with uh, some psychic perception. Uh, this idea goes way, way back, historically. Uh, there's the possibility that the pineal gland may be involved in production of DMT, endogenous uh, dimethyltryptophan, in which case uh, maybe it's related and maybe it's not. Uh, there, there hasn't been enough research to make a strong connection between any particular place in the body, whether it's the pineal or some other structure, and these abilities. But I, I'm aware of, of the lore. They're just like a lot of things in this realm, there isn't that much science that has been brought to bear on it yet. Yeah. I was wondering about um, one of the things that I'm sure a lot of the listeners might be able to relate to is that when you think of someone and then they call, um, I'm sure we a lot of us have had this experience. Now, what I was wondering is whether um, you might think that this is an aspect of telepathy where somehow... Um, pe people's thoughts or intentions are transferring through space and people are picking up on that, or whether it's an aspect of precognition, where you're actually already kind of answered the call from that person or see that's happened, or could it be, could it possibly be like an amalgamation of both coming together? Well, I wonder what your thoughts on that would be, maybe according to some of the yogic texts as well, if it ties in. Well, for, uh, I'll answer it first without referring to yoga. Uh, most theorists today expect that there's, there's really only one form of psi perception, mm. and, and we give them different names. I mean, we're adept at, and we immediately want to name something, and then we forget that the name is not the thing itself. So telepathy and clairvoyance kind of seem different because the nature of where the information is coming from is different, but there are many similarities between those phenomena. And so I think at a deeper level, they're probably the same single phenomenon. And one way to think about it then is, well, all of these phenomena are strange. Every psychic experience is strange for one reason, that it seems to transcend space and time. That's why it's odd. In clairvoyance, uh, it's transcending time, and, and then it becomes precognition. I mean, it, it flips back and forth very easily. And even the idea that mind and matter might interact, uh, at least at the quantum level, Pushing something and perceiving it are the same thing. So again, at a very deep level, it's so you, you start out with all these names and then you, you go further and further down the hierarchy and it turns out they're probably all the same thing. And my guess is what, the, what they're reflecting is that at a very deep level of physical reality, there isn't that much difference between mind and matter and it's completely holistic. Mm. So... Every scientist knows that, that the world is deeply interconnected. I mean, it, it didn't take us – you don't need to understand about ecology or the interdependence of banking to recognize that everything really is interconnected very deeply. What quantum mechanics has, has told us is that that form of interconnection goes all the way down into the subatomic world, and who knows what's below that. But at least we know when you get down into the, the world of the very small – things actually are interconnected across space and time. So we, we say, okay, well, we live in a holistic, very interconnected place that's connected between space and time. It shouldn't be that surprising then, and occasionally we have experiences that reflect that level of holism. And I think then what, by the time they bubble up into the level of human awareness, we call them psychic – but basically, it's it's simply a reflection of the way that the universe is stuck together. Dr. Radin, uh, through history of the scientific movement, there have been instances where the same discovery has been made in several different places simultaneously. Is this kind of related to what you're talking about? The, is it, are we in some kind of a quantum field that we... We give information to the field and get information from the field as well. 
Well, yes, it, it's possible that the idea of uh, of certain things happening in history, either ideas or uh, the appearance of Christ and Buddha almost exactly at the same time historically and so on, things seem to happen in waves. And they don't seem to be obviously connected to each other in any ordinary sense. That too might be reflecting of some sort of, of a holistic space that we live in, but we're we're evolutionarily shaped, in a sense, to feel separate. We use language, which causes us to create objects out of things and then name it, and then it becomes we're living with separate objects. But we know, I mean, science has progressed to the point where we know that at a deep level, that's actually not the case anymore. So we're at a very strange time in history where we've gone through this long several hundred year development in science where we're smart enough to be able to make iPhones and technology to do what we're doing here. And yet at the same time, when we try to interpret, well, what what do we actually know about the world, largely from physics? It's telling us, it's beginning to look more and more like what the mystics had been talking about thousands of years ago, that ultimately we really do live in a fully interconnected something that exists without time and without space. And we, uh, I mean, Alan Watts used to say that science is like knowing more and more about less and less. And so as we dissect things down to their little tiny minuscule little objects again and giving them a name, we've separated everything out and explained everything to a certain extent, but we can't get the total picture. The total picture gets lost somehow. And then we have the problem of corporations being in control of science now, and that's another issue. But right, <laughs> no, it's 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 related, of course. That the science is about the world of ideas. Uh, at some point, uh, people become interested in whether the ideas are pragmatic or not, and that gives rise to technology. And of course, then there are vested interests, but there are vested interests in the ideas alone. I mean, the whole academic system is based on on your individual idea. That, that's how you're, you're judged and assessed and promoted is on your ideas. So it creates an inertia for, for the ideas to be proposed and then maintained and fought against, and it's, it becomes a very adversarial system. That's, in some ways, it's okay. I mean, science has progressed the way that it did because people are willing to scream at each other and call each other names if necessary, mm-hmm. that the, to challenge the ideas, and that's why a skeptical attitude is so important in science. Yeah, criti- critical thinking is absolutely question crucial. Question everything, right? Question everything. One of the consequences over the long time is, as you mentioned, that when you begin to actually understand something, one of the things happen that happens is you begin to understand what is left to learn. And yeah. as soon as you see that, you see that we, you're, you're right. You begin to narrow down and say, oh, okay, now I understand this, but now there's all this additional stuff mm-hmm. that we don't understand at all. A very good example is the discovery of dark energy and dark matter. I mean, we, we know less than 94% of what's going on. All of our models are based on 94% of, of the, the unknown. So, is there room to learn more? Of course, there is. A lot, a lot of room is left. So, um, with the research that you're doing at the institute and the kind of um, research that you're bringing to light in your book, where do you see it going from there? How do you see it contributing to um, kind of humanity's um, progression? Like, I, I can imagine that the military might be interested in some of the, the kind of powers for obvious reasons. But how do you see it? Um, how do you see the future of? If, if your work, or I'm sure if your work really gets out there in the mainstream and it, and it gets a lot more accepted, how do you see um, the progression of events and how it could contribute to uh, the world that we're living in today with these abilities that you're mentioning in your book? Well, it, it's tempting to immediately spin out into short-term pragmatics. And there definitely are people in the military and elsewhere who are looking for ways of improving decision-making and guessing what's going to happen in advance and that sort of thing. One time, a long time ago, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, I was contacted by somebody in the Navy who was interested in communicating with submarines psychically because presumably it's not blocked by ordinary means, and that's the whole idea about submarines. But my, my interest is more on a matter of looking at our current worldview and seeing places that are not correct. 
And our current worldview has brought us uh, progressively towards one crisis after the other. And if that worldview doesn't change, then we can predict that 50 to 100 years from now, something really bad, there's going to be a perfect storm of really bad things happening that's, that's going to challenge the continuation of our species. So, how do we fix that? Well, we, we need to look very carefully then about the assumptions that we use to describe who we are, what we're, what we're capable of, uh, how we fit in with the rest of nature and the universe. And that's in some ways what the leading edge of science does in every discipline. And for the area that I've chosen, it has to do with the nature of consciousness. And the question comes down to, are we machines made out of meat? which is sort of the prevailing view in the neurosciences, in which consciousness is a side effect of brain processing, and that's all, may not have any other purpose, or is consciousness fundamental in some way? Is it important in the way that the, universe, that the physical world manifests? Is it important because it has causal properties that we don't understand yet? Do we have the cities? Are they really true? If that were widely embraced and, and funded as yet another discipline in science, Eventually, it would change our sense of who and what we are. Exactly how that spins out in terms of what the future is, I'm not quite sure. It's very difficult to predict. But one thing would be sure is that our, our worldview, our picture of, of who we are and how it fits into the world, that would change. And so I think like a lot of scientists, I hold an aspiration that it is better to know than not to know. It's better to hold a correct worldview than an incorrect one because you make a decision about what to do, how you act. It's better to have good information than bad information. It's that simple. Now, Dr. Radin, uh, I just wanted to – I was curious. Like, I can imagine being a scientist working in the field of research that, that you work in, that you're used to coming under scrutiny from uh, pseudo-skeptics. And uh, what are their main criticisms and are their accusations substantiated? Well, among pseudo-skeptics, no. I mean, pseudo, among what I would call proper skeptics, that's that's basically the kind of science that we do. It, myself and my colleagues are are very glad to get people who are skeptical and offer constructive criticism. I mean, that's that's basically the lifeblood of what we do. Uh, I don't want to waste my time doing something that's wrong. And so, if somebody, if I publish something or I give a talk, and somebody says, "Well, have you thought of this? And have you thought of that as a possible flaw?" And, and the argument, if they're correct, I'm very happy because it means I can fix it and I don't have to waste any time anymore on that. What, what is less helpful are people who are basically responding out of an ideological challenge, that they just don't like telepathy for some reason. They, yeah. they think it has something to do with religion or they think it is a de devolution backwards into superstition. I, I know where those feelings come from because there are things that I, I hear sometimes where I'm thinking this is not very helpful for us to think about such things. But I, I'm temperamentally different. I, like I, I don't mind if anybody talks about anything. I don't think talking is going to harm the world. What I do mind is when people then pr try to prevent uh, discussion about ideas. And in, in science in particular, um, presentation of theories and, and uh, empirical data are thrashed out all the time in, in conferences and in journals. If you pick up any journal on any topic, especially ones that are talking about experimental results, you have people screaming at each other all the time and calling each other bad names. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all about wanting to push towards what is probably true. Mm -hmm. So that that's par for the course. That's simply the way things happen. That's good. It's not always, um, it, it's not always fun, but as it's the way things happen. Yeah. I'd like to open the phone line for uh, skeptics to call in if we have any, <laughs> or people that want to add to the conversation. Um, so nine two three three nine one one. If you're out of the area, one eight hundred five six eight three seven two three. Give us a call. You know, see if you have a question for Dr. Radin, or uh, are you maybe you're skeptical about uh, psychic phenomena and you want to make a statement about that? Go ahead and call in. It's and I would this, add, mm -hmm. uh, it also callers who are, are practicing yoga and/or meditation and who feel that they have experienced 
one or more of the cities. Yeah, and we have a caller. Um, Larry's getting him on here right now. Got him? Hello, caller. Hi, Brian. Hello. Uh, were, were, were there any questions you'd like to put to uh, Dr. Raiden? Uh, were there any questions you'd like to put to, put to uh, Dr. Raiden? And I, I can't hear it. Oh. Okay. It's not coming from Skype anymore. Yeah. You know, I think you're uh, verging out of the universe of our discussion, like our like that ex satellite or that that Voyager. <laughs> Voyager that just left the solar system, solar system <laughs> and is entering intergalactic space. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't think. Um, and you know, uh, can actually hear the. Uh, Brian, thanks for the call. We, uh, Doctor Raiden, can't hear you. We're going to try to figure that out. He's on Skype, and thanks, Brian. Thank you. And can you summarize? Yeah. What was said? Uh, well, <laughs> well, he was especially talking yeah. about the 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 dark nature of. Human um, intellect or mentality. There's a dark nature, and and uh, we need to get in connection with. I don't know. It's kind of like a, um, psychotherapy based on psychic phenomenon and stuff. I didn't really get the connection. I didn't grok it well, very well. I can offer a comment on that. The, in the in the yoga uh, literature and classical yoga, or if you go to an ashram today, uh, the yogic path, way before you get to the cities, you spend a, a long time, perhaps years, learning to get your your morals and your ethics uh, uh, solid. Yeah, and I think the, that the has to come first, right? Yeah, it comes first, and the reason is that uh, the the goal of yoga is to become enlightened, which one way to think of it is that 
it's a, a realization where the self with a small s and the universe with a large s, uh, that, that they're the same thing. That's what self-realization and enlightenment are all about. So in order to get there, you're going to pass through various stages as you, you gain better and better contact with your unconscious through meditation and yoga practice. When you start bumping up against the cities, you recognize that it's a power. I mean, they're literally a kind of power that you can use. We know that power is seductive. It, it will corrupt you. And the reason why there's so much emphasis paid in the yoga tradition to not demonstrate the yoga, the, the, the superpowers, and once you gain these things, don't dwell on it and don't demonstrate it, is because the power will corrupt you. And the, the, the mythical version of this is when, uh, w when we end up with Darth Vader, that power corrupts, especially power of this type is very, is very seductive. And it was learned many years before the Yoga Sutras were written, probably over millennia, that the moment somebody starts getting their ego inflamed about demonstrating these amazing powers, they're headed for a bad time. Yeah, okay, and so this, that's an excellent answer to yeah. Brian's uh, uh, inquiry. And we have a couple of more callers, Larry. Let's see. Let's take another one. Hello, caller. Yeah. Although my referring to his last caller, uh, I've been hearing voices, and I refuse to take the medication that they are offering me. Is there a place, a psychic institute, where you, I can receive training or focus through whatever training it is that you recommend? I heard that. Uh, what, one, of the, uh, one of the ways of dealing with this is to go to therapists who are sympathetic with the idea that hearing voices does not necessarily mean that you're schizophrenic. And, I mean, it may well be that people are diagnosed as schizophrenic uh, because we, psychiatry doesn't know what else to do. So there's something called the Spiritual Emergence Network, which is a, a, a nationwide uh, network of therapists who are sympathetic to the possibility that in some cases that hearing voices may mean that it's a, an uncontrolled form of psychic ability. Now, of course, this is not true in every case, which is why you need an expert therapist in order to be able to tell the difference. And the, what the bottom line usually is that if, if you're functional, like you're, you're able to hold a job and have responsibilities and all that stuff, and you hear voices, but it doesn't matter too much, well, then, then there may be a way of, of doing a therapy to, to figure out how to deal with it. On the other hand, if the voices are intrusive and, and you can't function because of it, well, then you need medical help. It, it's that simple. So, again, Spiritual Emergence Network is something you can... Spiritual... Do you have a phone number for them? Spiritual, spiritual Emergence Network. Spiritual Emergence Network. You can find it on Google probably in three minutes. I'll find out. I, I live where I live. I mean, the, the transistor radio, and I'm lucky to have a landline. You know, I, I contact the, the K-Mud rule. I'm just going to throw that out there. The, Okay, so I, I'm looking on Google, uh, and let's see here. There are, yeah, here's a phone number. Phone number is 415-453-1106. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 415-453-1106. Thank you. And let's see, we have yet another caller. Hello, caller. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I missed the very beginning of the show, but I'm wondering if you, uh, it seems like you might have started by mentioning that there was an increase in psychic phenomena in the last couple of decades or so or something. Is that true, or do you believe that? Um, Did you get that through, okay, Dean? Yes, I heard that, yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't heard that there's an increase in psychic phenomena. Uh, the, there are surveys that are done by uh, Gallup poll and Roper and those kinds of folks uh, about every couple of years, and it shows uh, the degree of belief 
in, of in these phenomena over long periods of time, and it's pretty much stable. Uh, the, the belief in in psychic phenomena is more or less stable at around 60% of the population in the United States. Belief in various aspects, like belief in angels, goes up and down. Uh, be belief in UFOs goes up and down. Belief in specific topics fluctuates from year to year, but general overall belief, uh, which generally reflects people's experiences, has been stable. It hasn't been changing that much. I guess possibly through the awareness as well and, and the different mediums, um, i.e. the internet and, and probably it being covered a lot more on mainstream television now, these kind of phenomena, it might be more, might be more people aware of it, so it might, people might understand what's happening to them possibly more in their right. lives. Yeah, there's also a, a reflection that happens in the in the media. So uh, television shows, movies go through uh, go through periods where there's a lot of shows having to do with something psychic, and it gives the impression that there's something new, but it's 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 just uh, it's just modulations in the entertainment business more or less. I wish I could remember where I got this from because it was quite a while ago. It was like it was like you know somewhere between 10 and 20 years ago. Hmm. And I read uh, somebody who was uh, studying uh, psychic phenomena and everything, and his, uh, his belief was that the reason that it was, this was happening and it was more and more in our present day, um, in our present day Earth was because we were getting ready for a transition into the next dimension and we had one foot in the next dimension. If you heard anything like that, does that sound any kind of familiar to you at all? Because I was really yeah, interested I've, in that, and it sounded really feasible to me. Yeah, I, I've heard stories like that. Uh, I have psychic friends who believe that. They believe that we're heading towards some transition, but you don't need to be psychic to, to see that. You just need to pay attention to the news, and you realize that... Uh, there, there are all kinds of things that are happening uh, simply as a result of greater interconnectivity in media and technology. I mean, there are lots, lots of reasons to expect that humanity is headed towards some sort of transition. Whether it's psychic or not, I don't know. But, yeah, psychic. It has to be psychic or not, but this was just that because we're in our evolution, we are like, you know, part way in one and part way in the other and 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 the uh and the tel tele telepathy and, and all of that stuff was a part of of what our new being was was forming into you know we were well, becoming it, it's more, possible more capable of those things because that's that's where we were going with our evolution right Right. It, it it may well be possible whether – I mean, I don't know anybody who's tracking that very closely, but I wouldn't dismiss it as a possibility. Sorry, do you know if there are any studies like that going on? Yeah, he wanted to know if there are any studies like that going on now. I see. I, I'm not aware of any, no. Thanks for your call. We have another caller uh, waiting, and uh, let's see what they have to say. Hello, caller. Hi, Harvey. Hello, bud. Thanks. And thanks to your wonderful guests. Um, well, uh, Dean, um, hello, Allie and, and uh, Ben. Hello. Um, Dean, well, if you, if, I have some information that you might like. If you go to YouTube and you put in the words, large-scale structures of the universe, large-scale structures of the universe, this is, uh, NASA put this together. They took all the, the information from all the telescopes around the planet and all the Hubble and all the, and they, they combined the known, all the information that collected by all these, uh, these various uh, telescopes and, and they put it into, they squeeze it all into one frame. And you can basically see the whole known universe as far as our instruments can reach out. And what they do is they fly through this. Uh, and it turns out that there's these large-scale structures in the universe that look exactly like brain neurons. Mm -hmm. That if you also go to YouTube and put in the word brain neurons and look at them, you'll see that these large-scale structures look just like that. So it may be that dark matter is brain matter and that these large scales are neurons, so we're actually living 
in a living universe. I mean, it looks like a brain. And so maybe our brain is a modem into the meta internet, into the bigger uh, As above, brain. so below. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's all psychic all day. And as far as entanglement, quantum entanglement is concerned, well, you know, quantum entanglement is when you have two particles and they're, they're entangled, if you separate them no matter how far, uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you affect one, the other is automatically affected. So it turns out that according to our scientists, we all vibe from a... We all, uh, the universe sprang forth from a primordial atom. So if that's true, then we're all entangled, each and every one of us, on a physical plane. So uh, I think that, you know, morphic fields and, uh, and all that, it's very much very natural stuff. My dog is screaming here. So <laughs> I gotta, it's interesting the dog waited for this moment to go crazy. <laughs> okay, well, thanks yeah. a lot. I love the show, and um, listening, I'm listening very close. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've, I've written about this idea in my book, The Conscious Universe, uh, and again in, in another book called Entangled Minds. And I've seen this, this idea of uh, the structure of the universe looking suspiciously like neurons. Uh, some of that may not be too surprising given that, as, as far as we can tell, the cell similarity or fractal structure seems to go from the very small to the very large. And so... The kinds of, of uh, self-similar structures that we are used to at the human scale probably scale up to the galaxy and the universe uh, itself. Whether that means that the that the universe is like, like a giant brain, I guess it's possible. And I, I know people who are uh, very interested in what they call the electric universe, and this is uh, the notion that we normally think of deep space as being completely empty, but of course. That's true only in certain places. In other places, there are these plasmas, electric plasmas, that connect huge areas of the galaxy and, be, and even between galaxies. And we think of those connections as axons coming out of neurons, whereas just electrical signals going between neurons, who knows? At the scale of the universe itself, maybe it is some kind of an information processor. So that's possible. And we have yet another couple of calls. Let's see what the next one has. Hello? Uh, hello, caller. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I really am glad you're talking about all this stuff. This is really neat. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't have any skepticism. I personally have experienced, uh, um, mm, let's see, um, where you get that gut feeling and, you know, you have a feeling you should or shouldn't do something. And I've learned to pay attention because when I used to just dismiss that uh, and then went ahead and did what my gut told me not to do, then it didn't turn out so good. And so I decided to follow those feelings and honor them. And uh, it seems then the outcome is much more positive. So I have no idea how it works. I'm not that much of a scientist. And uh, even you say, you know, it's kind of mysterious to know because of the time and the spacing. Nobody really knows how it works. But I think that also, like, um, if somebody, I'll be thinking of somebody and thinking, oh, I should call that person. I really want to talk to them. And they'll call me. Happens all the time. Especially since me and my, uh, between me and my daughter. And maybe there's like a genetic karmic connection there that's really strong and has something to do with it. But um, I believe that all people uh, have psychic ability. I don't think it's a special quality, but I think because our culture doesn't support it and thinks that it's, um, you know, some kind of magical woo-woo thing, and, you know, I, you know, you hear somebody go, oh, I'm psychic. Well, good for you. You're in touch with that. But I think if we, you know, I think we all have that ability. We just don't, we don't develop it because we don't believe in it. But I've always honored it and uh, just gone along with it. Um, I guess, but maybe just leading on from that um, is, um, would you, would you, Dr. Raiden, um, possibly recommend any techniques for the listeners out there in order to enhance um, a kind of a deeper connection with your intuition? The, you, the, actually, actually, if you take, take my, my voice, voice away, away from, from there now, now because it's creating a, a loop and I <laughs> can't even think. Uh, what I, the way I would respond is that uh, the traditional method of training. Uh, enhanced sensitivity for, for this area is very simple. It's meditation. And the, the reason is that all of the research we know suggests that these phenomena come up from the unconscious. 
it, it is true that everyone is psychic in the sense that we're all conscious beings. We are living in the world. It's something to do with the interconnectivity of the world itself. But by the time you get up into the frontal lobes, the frontal lobes of the brain are very, very good at getting rid of most of what's out there. So there are some neurologists who have estimated that the amount of information that's coming at us, either bubbling up from the inside or coming through the senses, is approximately one trillion times more than what we actually are consciously aware of. And we're, we're filtering it all out all the time. And you, you kind of have to do that because otherwise you'd be overwhelmed. So if you can imagine uh, a practice that would allow you to safely gain that attention better, it would be meditation. I read a very interesting article in the um, New Yorker about the, the brain's uh, function and getting those aha moments where, like, you know, just something comes to you that's like everything just kind of falls together. And it said that what you need to have those moments is you need uh, to be relaxed and focused. And, of course, meditation does that for you. Smoking right. a good doobie will do that, too. But, um, uh, and I've had a lot of real good aha moments when I've had a few puffs and just relaxed and looked out the window, but um, yes, uh, uh, to, but but some something chemical and electrical was going on in the brain during these focused, relaxed times. I don't remember what they were, uh, but there was a scientific explanation for that. But that's not quite the same as the psychic phenomena. Um, no, I think I, actually it's similar. It's a similar phenomena that you know we, we tend to make a distinction between improved insight, improved intuition, and psychic, and it's really all part of a spectrum. Pulling jewels out of the sky. There was a, a popular guru in India a while back that was famous for supposedly pulling jewels, you know, just out of the sky. You know, they, they'd appear in his hand. He always right. had long sleeves on. I'm sure they were up his sleeve first. <laughs> There's such a, you know, the illusionism, you know, what we call magic, like David Copperfield's magic. It's, it's a, you know, it's an art of illusionism, making you think something is happening that's not. And I think an awful lot of that goes on, uh, to, for, to, especially in India, you know, and then people want to believe, like, oh, wow, it's magic. It's supernatural. Well, the way I feel about supernatural, I, I don't believe in the supernatural. My feeling is the natural is super enough. Uh, there, there's, um, you know, the natural laws of uh, the way things are, uh, whether you want to call it God or creation or anything, um, are amazing. And, and that's what keeps everything going. So to have something that goes against that to prove that something special uh, that doesn't impress me. You know, I'm, I'm just impressed by the real natural world. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we have another call. Thanks. That was a good point. And a good I'll just uh, add on to that uh, that caller's idea that uh, I agree with with much of what she said, and that's essentially the theme of my book, Supernormal. That the, these are normal phenomena at the very extremes of normal, you find very odd stuff happening. But for most people, most of the time, psychic abilities are normal. And I, I go into that in this book. Yeah, and let's see, we have another call. Uh, let's see what they have to ask. Hello, caller. Hey, how you doing? Good. Yeah, my name is Rye. I study this stuff all the time. In fact, uh, have you ever heard of matrix energetics? Yes. Yeah, consciousness technology. It's been the old mystic from thousands of years ago and science is kind of coming together at, at, at this point for some reason, you know. Um, but now it kind of, in my, in my perspective, seems to be changing a bit. Like, hey, you know the concept of the holographic universe or as some people say a virtual reality universe where basically we're making it all up or winking at the same time, if you will. Right. So, I was just always wondering, is it like we're shifting into par doing the parallel, parallel universe of every second and giving the illusion of a co cohesive linear space-time that we think is very logical, you know, and it's one thing to intellectually try to get that, but to live in that world where you really are making it all up, 
Is that like what, waking up in a lucid dream? I don't know. It's just something I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, possibly. When we come to theoretical explanations for these kinds of things, uh, it's anybody's guess at this point. One of, one of the reasons that I focus on taking these phenomena into the lab is uh, I can't I can't hear what's being said now, so I'm I'm sorry if I'm stepping on on top of you. Uh, no, I, I I'm talking through Skype, and I can only hear uh, what you're saying when the microphone's held near the computer. <laughs> Oh, so I, I must have missed something you just said. Oh, yeah. Have you heard of Tom Kebble's work, My Big Toe? Yes, I was interviewed with Tom, and there are some YouTubes on that. Oh, yeah. I find that to be interesting. It's kind of the same line. Oh, I find it very interesting what people can do if you go to a seminar, learning how to drop into the field of the heart. And I say field of the heart literally a 30-foot field that comes from the heart mm -hmm. that seems to have a different level of intelligence than the brain. And it seems to be a little more flexible way of communication, for lack of a better word. Is that, are you tying in with, uh, the, is it the Global Coherence Initiative, Dean? Have you ever done any work with those, with the Global Consciousness Project? So I've always been interested because they have uh, worldwide like kind of meditation um, hours, I believe, in, in different uh, moon cycles. And I wondered if if you've ever, uh, you work with the Global Consciousness Project, have you ever um, come up with, uh, have you had any, had any had any correlating results, the times that they've been doing those global meditation hours in the heart-based meditation? Well, the Global Coherence Initiative and the Global Consciousness Project are two different things. Yeah, I understand. I just wondered if you've ever got together on studies or if any any of those things have ever happened. We, what we do is, uh, I, I'm an analyst on the Global Consciousness Project. Uh, when we learn about a large-scale meditation that's happening, we'll generally put that in as one of the uh, events that we study. Uh, so we've looked at many of those, many large-scale meditations. Most recently, not a meditation, but uh, the burning of the man at Burning Man. Oh. We, we have done that last year and we did it again this year to see whether this year there's roughly 65,000 people all paying attention to the burning of the man. And we had six random number generators on the playa, six wow. different types of generators, to see whether the, the effect that people talk about when they're there, there's some kind of a zone that everybody gets into, to see if it would affect the generators, given that they have different sources of randomness, for one thing, and also if they'd all be affected at the same time, because then it's more like we're dealing with a real field effect. Mm. So I'm still analyzing the data, but what we've seen so far is that all generators combined do show a significant effect at the very beginning of the ceremony. So mm -hmm. it, this year, I don't know about past years, but this year, two, there are two events of interest with the Burning Man. One was exactly at 9 o'clock at night on August 31st, the Burning Man, which had been standing with his arms down, the arms are raised up. So it's a moment where the arms get pulled up at 9 o'clock, which sig signals the beginning of the ceremony. 30 minutes later is when it's ignited. Mm. So between the raising of the arms and the ignition is a period where there's a lot of fire dancers and there's a lot of excitement and stuff. But if you think of it in terms of large-scale attention coherence, for 30 minutes there wasn't much. There was a lot when the man, man's arms went up because everyone was paying attention, but then nothing about 30 minutes. So what we see in the generators is that within a couple of seconds of the arms raising, there's a very significant change in order in the random generators. They weren't behaving randomly. And then the next question is, well, was that due to one generator that went haywire or was it due to all of them? And the answer is it was due to all of them. Wow. It was an effect happening in all of them at the same time that caused this big change. So that's that's pretty good evidence. There's something like a real field effect that is created by, in this case, 65,000 people all paying attention to one thing at the same time. And what makes the Burning Man a, a very nice venue to do this kind of experiment is it's in the middle of nowhere with no power grid. Mm -hmm. So all of our computers and generators are all running on battery. There's there are no other large-scale power sources nearby. So the usual criticisms that we're picking up environmental changes it just wasn't there and wow. we still get the effect cool well you know we have uh, we still have uh, uh, several callers but I want you uh, to make it real short now because we don't have much time this is uh, almost the end of the show so maybe we could take one maybe two more 
uh, callers. And thank you. Hello, caller. Hi. Uh, short question. I um, have experienced a couple of events in my life that make me kind of suspect that I actually exist in a couple of other planes, dimensions, times. I'm not quite sure. But um, I was wondering if you could comment on that as far as, like, you know, different universes, I guess. Anyway, that's my question. I'll listen up here. Thanks. Thanks. Well, the thing is that uh, once, once you leave an ordinary state of awareness, if you think about this from an evolutionary point of view, our, our bodies and our brains and our minds are shaped by evolution to pay very close attention to here and now. And if that were not the case, then as a separate organism, you wouldn't survive for very long. You know, you'd walk out there and get hit by a car, even by a, some kind of a creature. So it's in the or non-ordinary states. Uh, dreaming, drugs, dancing, all that stuff, that's where the unconscious is allowed to get into your awareness. And once that happens, all bets are off in terms of, of what you perceive. Uh, as far as we can tell, we, we live in a, a very, very complicated reality where maybe we do exist simultaneously at many different times and places. There are a couple of pretty well-documented cases where individuals momentarily felt that they were at a different time. And the most famous case I can think of are a couple of women walking around uh, the, the Palace of Versailles in France. In, in contemporary time, they walk around the corner and suddenly everything they see suggests that they're in the same place, but they're in the 17th century. People are wearing period costumes, they're talking in an ancient form of French, and so on. Of course, they're stunned by this, and they both had the same experience. They go around another corner, and they're back into present time. So this is unusual because you had two people corroborating a very strange event that suggests something like, in the right frame of mind, you, you can be in a different time all of a sudden. So I wouldn't say that it's impossible that uh, a feeling of being on some other plane, some other time, existence, we can't rule that out. Uh, whether it's literally real or not is a whole other matter, and it, it's very difficult to know in any given case if it's real. Uh, but I would say that uh, since we don't actually know yet very much about uh, the, the nature of reality in its largest sense, I'd, I'd put it down as one of those strange things that happen uh, that someday maybe we'll be smart enough to, be, to give an answer. Thank you. Well, you know, thank you, Dr. Radin, for being on the show today. Um, uh, as you can tell by the calls, this was really important information for people to hear. And everybody seems to be very interested in this subject, and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. And so that's it for Edge of the Herd. Tune in next month, third Sunday, when I'll be interviewing Jeffrey Smith, author of Seeds of Deception and uh, the movie Genetic Roulette. There are still people among us who think that genetically modified food has been proven safe. This is not the case. Don't miss Edge of the Herd in October. Thanks to Dr. Dean Radin for being on the show. Thanks to Ollie Boone and Richard Benjamea for their contributions. And thanks to Larry Lashley for engineering. Stay tuned for Agnes' World Beat Show. This has been your host, Bud Rogers. Love to all. Ollie has one more. Yeah, I, th I think just before we go, um, Dean, could you just let people know uh, just a little um, about where your book would be available? Supernormal, I think. I believe it's in the bookstores now. Right. Supernormalbook.com is a web page that, that gives buttons that go to every online bookstore. And I've even seen it at airports. Excellent. So it's pretty widely distributed. Supernormalbook.com. Okay. Excellent. So if any listeners enjoyed the show, please go out and get a copy of that. Thank you very much, yeah, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.